Welcome to the Faith Lutheran Church Bible Study, The Triumph of the Lamb, a study in Revelation. Tonight in our Wednesday class, we continue our discussion on the letters to the seven churches and focus on the letter to the church in Sardis from Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Let's listen in. Let's pray. Father, thanks for this evening together, this time to study your word, and we pray, Lord, you would bless our conversation this evening. We, we pray, God, that you would give us wisdom and insight as to what your texts are teaching us so that we would rightfully and faithfully believe in your word. We pray you would hear our prayers tonight and answer them according to your will. We pray for Joyce, that you would grant her health and strength in her body, especially as she awaits her treatment this next week. We ask you, God, to guide her and grant her healing and strength. Be with her through this time. We pray for Laverne as she had an MRI today. We thank you that everything came back uh, good, and we pray, Lord, that you would keep her healthy and strong now, help her to recover, and Lord, let your hand be upon her. And we pray for Tyler as he travels to Mexico. We pray, God, that you would send your angels to guide him on his journey, give him a safe trip there and home, bless his time there, and help him to enjoy himself. We pray also tonight for Marv Bruns. We thank you, Lord, that he's doing better, and we ask for your hand to continue to be upon him and strengthen him. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. All right, so letter to Sardis. Any follow-up on the letters from uh, Revelation, the first chapter, or excuse me, chapter 2? We are coming up on the end of that. We're actually going into a new chapter, believe it or not. Anything? All right, let's get into it. Now notice, this will be a little tricky next week, this idea when we get to Philadelphia, but notice how there has been so far a sort of increase of the sin in each church. So remember in Ephesus, they lo- they left their first love, which meant then in Smyrna that they started to love two masters. And then the, as a result of that sort of thing happening, then Pergamum, you see, they're kind of further along down the path um, where they're beginning to listen to false teachers like Balaam and Balak. By the time we get to Thyatira, uh, they're getting into bed with Jezebel. <laughs> no pun intended. Uh, they're doing the things that Jezebel has called them to do. Actually, a, a pun was intended. Um, they're doing the things that they're not supposed to be doing. Now we get to Sardis, and it's going to get bad. Jesus is about as angry as it gets until we get to Laodicea, where it's, it's beyond that. Um, but Sardis is the first letter where Jesus is, is, this is about the harshest letter we have apart from Laodicea. So uh, there'll be some stuff to listen to here. Uh, and it is curious, I think, um, what he's angry about. And, and so we'll get into this tonight. Uh, can somebody read for us then chapter 3, verses 1 through 7? Got it. Thank you, Ron. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things set he that had hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Be be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works Hmm. perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on these, thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Okay. So we're dealing with Sardis. This is 50 miles northeast of Ephesus. Thank you, Ron. A great and powerful city in the Mediterranean for some time. It was the capital of ancient Lydia the seat of the Persian governor during the Persian Empire, and highly esteemed by the Greeks, but not anymore. By the time we get to this letter, uh, it has been out of power for quite some time, and they're living sort of on the reputation of the past. Uh, they, they look back and they're, they're very proud of what they were, but they're certainly not that anymore. Okay, 
Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of a great example besides the Missouri Senate to give you here uh, for what this might actually look like. <laughs> it's just a terrible shot at myself in our own church body. But um, someone who looks back on the relics of the past um, and what, what used to be but is no more and still takes great pride in that, uh, that's kind of what you have with Sardis, okay? Um, I'm sure I'll think of something along the way here. And now, this will kind of uh, be important as we go through this. Uh, it's worth noting that uh, in the past, one of the reasons that led to their demise was when they were attacked, they had poor watchmen on the wall, bad defenders. They kind of fell asleep on the job, you might say, and they did not protect the city, not once, but twice. So Pergamum, or excuse me, Sardis was overthrown twice uh, because of bad, lazy um, soldiers not doing their jobs, not protecting the city, something like that. So Jesus, it seems, when we get to this letter today, is going to play with that idea as he deals with the issues that are going on in Sardis. Uh, you know, you look pretty strong, you look good to yourselves, but you need to wake up because you're about to lose it again in a spiritual sense. So that's what we're going to get to there. Okay. Um, what, what did your, how did verse 2 start there in the, the King James, Ron? Verse 2? Be watchful. Be watchful. See, I think, I think wake up is what mine has, and that translation is very good at grasping the immediacy of what needs to go on. You need to wake up. Yeah. But be watchful, though it sounds a little more tame, if you're hearing it in that con, I mean, the word means the same thing in Greek, but the idea here is if you're hearing it in the context of you are a part of a people that has failed to be watchful, and then Jesus says, be watchful, your mind goes, oh, oh, I get it. So I think that's actually a helpful translation once you understand the context. But for us, when you hear the wake up, there, there's an immediacy to that, that, okay, things are pretty bad at this point. Um, but I, I, but I, that be watchful is a sort of a helpful thing. Who is Jesus here? Well, how does he describe himself? Like a thief. No, yes, <laughs> but in verse 1, what's the Christological indicator? Uh, seven spirits. Seven, the one who holds the seven spirits and seven stars. Seven stars. Okay. Um, what did we see? We've talked about this seven spirits before. What does the seven spirits represent? So one, four. one four, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seven churches. No. That's what it says in my Bible. No. Oh. He who is holy, and uh, the key of uh, the, uh, relates back to David, the son of. Nope, 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 nope. One four. Can someone read one four for us, please? That's what I read. No, I you read the. Down here, read the, read the whole verse, verse one four. Okay. Where, where is it? Read four and five. I can't even see where four is. What's it start with? Oh, John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Now, we said something about this. Let's call it, to, to, this is a big hint, okay? This invocation of the book. Who is the one who is and was and is to come? That refers to whom? Jesus. No. no. God the Father. And then in verse 5 he says, and from Jesus. So we're getting a greeting from the Father and from Jesus and from the seven spirits, which leaves who? Who's not being mentioned? The Holy Spirit. Okay. I wrote those notes right in here. Last time you said it, I just <laughs> see, see, good, good. Uh, and now that you're in your their, now that they're in your Bible, yeah. Word of God. All right. <laughs> maybe not. Maybe not quite so much. But uh, the set, now, why would we say seven spirits represents simply the Holy Spirit? How did we get at this? This was nine weeks ago. <laughs> or seven, seven means complete. Yes, right. Seven means complete or fullness. Remember. And we might say the translation is right, seven spirits, but in our minds we might want to be thinking something like the sevenfold spirit of God. That is, the spirit of God who is everywhere. Or specifically, in this case, 
with the churches. Remember we said this, you have seven churches, and they're talking about specifically seven churches, but these seven churches are also representative of the complete church. Okay. Now, if you have the seven spirits with the seven churches, the idea there is the Holy Spirit is with the whole church. The whole Holy Spirit is with the whole, whole church. Okay? And so uh, this, this is what is represented here. So he, Jesus is the one who has the seven spirits of God. Or to use Jesus' language in John's gospel, we might say it this way. Jesus is the one who sends the spirit. Jesus is the one who sends the spirit to the church. Now, do you remember what Jesus does this? This is amazing stuff. Jesus says to the disciples, I'm leaving, and that's good news for you. Because if I don't go away, I would not send the Spirit, or the, par- uh, the Comforter, or the Counselor, or the Paraclete, or however you want to interpretate. interpretate. Uh, it's, it's a rough confirmation class tonight. We all want to interpret that. Um, the idea here is Jesus goes to heaven and sends the Spirit to the church so that the Spirit can do what? Deliver Christ. Jesus says, I will send you the Spirit and he will testify to you about me. So here's the job of the Spirit, is to bring Christ. And here's the job of Christ, to give us the Spirit. It's partially what they do. It's a very reciprocal relationship they have there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so where the Holy Spirit is, there is Jesus. Where Jesus is, there's the Holy Spirit. All right? Makes Why? sense? Huh? Why? Why not? <laughs> Why not have a three-way? If two-way is good, wouldn't three-way be better? What, what do you mean? What, what's the third with the Father? Said, uh, Jesus brings the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit brings Jesus. So it seems like that's a... Why does just Jesus come directly? Why does he need the Holy Spirit? He does with the Holy Spirit. I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, I mean, it's sort of... That's a good question. And that I can't answer. I, I mean, it, it, this is the way it's described in the Scriptures. So in other words, what we have to do here is say, all right... Here's what Jesus gives us. Now we have to figure out how this works, as opposed to saying that doesn't make sense. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to say this properly. We go with it because it's what the text says. How's that? <laughs> this is the way Jesus describes it, and say, "All right, well, huh? Because it makes sense to me. If say there's two, there's a father and a son, and the son, the father sends the son in a spiritual way." That makes sense. In fact, there's some churches who take it, not churches, but there are some uh, cults who would take it that way, that Jesus, there's not really a Holy Spirit person, but he's a power that comes from Jesus that brings you, that that's Christ is giving. That's, that's Mormonism. I think that you, you know more about Mormonism, it seems. But I don't think for them the Spirit is actually a person, right? Is it the Holy Ghost? Yeah, same. Uh, yeah. The Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, yeah, same thing. Have a good explanation for the Holy Ghost. No, yeah, it's, it's sort of a, a power. Power. Yeah, see, the, see, in order to attain Godhood, you have to have a, have a body and fulfill the law. And the Holy Spirit couldn't have done that because it had a body. You're curious, yeah. So, so, they, don't, so they, don't, they don't know what exactly to call the Holy Spirit. Interesting, that's a curious thing. Where in the Christian church, we give the Holy Spirit person. We don't give it, but we understand that the Holy Spirit has personhood in that he is God. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He is one person of that Trinity. And so the what we know of him is to bring Christ to us. And he's the one at work in the churches to deliver Christ. I guess that's how I would say it. it you kind of picture this too. I mean, it's the Spirit who empowers the work of God throughout the Scripture. So when Jesus comes, when does his ministry begin? When does Jesus' ministry begin? Right after the baptism, and what happens on the ba- at the baptism? Spirit. Spirit comes upon him, and I'm working through some stuff right now. I'm taking this course online about Mark, and it's curious in Mark's gospel when it talks about the coming of the Spirit in the form of the dove. It doesn't say a dove with the Spirit inside of it came down. It says the Spirit descended like a dove, and it doesn't say upon him. It's almost in a sense that it comes, sort of enters him, which is a curious thing to think about here. Uh, so that once the Spirit comes to Christ, he is now led by the Spirit to do the work of the Father. This is the way that, this is how we know the Trinity is working, by watching the ministry of Jesus. The Father sends the Son, and the Spirit empowers the Son to do the work of the Father. It's a very interesting thing. Um, 
in, and I think it's Luke's gospel, it's in Mark's gospel, the spirit throws Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And I think in Luke's gospel, he's carried by the spirit, but either way, it's the spirit now taking Jesus to do the work of God, see? So why does it work that way? I'm not sure. But what we see in the story is that it's the spirit who empowers the work of God in the world. That's his job. That's what he's doing. And what's the work of God? To proclaim Christ. Does that make sense? You guys following me here? I'm not answering your question, but I, guess, I don't think I can. But I think this gets at the story of, of how it takes place. Um, There's a little... Um Introduction. It's a good. It's a great question, though, Keith. I have the same version you do, but uh, this is a pictorial version, and there's a little commentary. It says that the book consists of a series of visions, uh-huh. dreams, uh-huh. and revelations. Revelation in symbolic language that makes interpretation of this book very difficult. Uh huh. Yeah. Right. Right. This is this is most certainly true, as we like to say in the Catechism. Um, and so, I mean, if someone were to come up with a, a better understanding of what the seven spirits are than that, we'd be all ears and willing to listen. But, but I, I tend to think that this idea of it being the Holy Spirit is, makes sense in light of everything else we know about the relationship of Christ and the Spirit. Christ has the Spirit and gives the Spirit to the church to empower the church to do its ministry. That, that's kind of the idea there. Have you ever heard of the sevenfold description of the Holy Spirit? Yeah, someone read that this morning, so this morning I did. <laughs> go ahead and read it, yeah. yeah. Oh, I mean, I don't have to. I just, it's, I just it's heard it before. Well, oh, okay, go. Good, yeah, terrific. From uh, the 11th chapter of Isaiah, the second verse, it gives you a good clue as to what the sevenfold attributes Interesting. of the Spirit is. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, and this is talking about Christ. Okay. Um, the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. Okay, so this is very curious. That's the language of Isaiah. Isaiah. So there we have the Holy Spirit and the number seven already associated with each other which I think actually lends better credence to the idea of the seven spirits referring to the Holy Spirit. That, that makes and a lot I more think sense. That's in even better with the baptism. Yeah, because the Spirit, the spirit descends upon him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, good, good. Hold on. I just want to see something very quickly. Because why study ahead of time when you can do it now? John 1, Jesus, when John is describing Jesus, he says... I see, yeah, it's great, perfect. So in John's gospel, he says, verse 32, chapter 1, John the Baptist bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove and remained on him. So there's that Isaiah language, same author, sevenfold Spirit. I mean, these connections start to make sense. Okay, so there you go. Good, it's good. It's all connected. Now, how do you know if a church has the Holy Spirit? Yes, exactly right. You see the speaking in tongues. Rob Phillips, who's always so delightful in this particular conversations, <laughs> says this morning, hey, you want to know how to get kicked out of a Pentecostal college? Uh, which is really how Rob starts 35% of his conversations with me. And I've done the percentages. That's absolutely right. Uh, he says, you, or no, this one was, you want to know how to uh, make your professor mad at a Pentecostal college? No, Rob, how do you do that? And the answer is, hear very carefully the answer I gave him. No, but how do you do it? Because I'm going to hear it anyways. Um, just joking. Rob says, he says, you ask, your, you ask your professor at the Pentecostal College why they speak in tongues in Islam and Hinduism and Mormonism and Buddhism. Because they don't like that question. Because in the Pentecostal churches, proof of the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. And if that's your proof, Rob wants to know, do the Mormons have the Holy Spirit? Do the Muslims have the Holy Spirit? Uh, the professors, he said, didn't answer his question, just scowled at him. <laughs> Which I didn't know was an option for Rob. You know, that's a pretty good thing. Uh, so, but that, I mean, he's got a great question right there. 
is to- are tongues a sign of the Spirit? Now, they, they can be. I mean, in the book of Acts, it happens from time to time, all right? Uh, but there, the tongues are not given, in a sense, purely as proof positive that you have the Holy Spirit. It's more to speak the language of people standing around you who can't understand what's going on. Um, that's why I think there's a strange verse where it says, Tongues are given for the outsider. No, that's 1 Corinthians. I'd have to look at that again. But that's not, you, you can't put that as the proof. It's It just can't be. Um, so how do you know you have the Holy Spirit? Well, if everybody's speaking in tongues and nobody understands it, there's no point. In it. Well, this is terrific. We were talking about this this morning. Have you guys ever heard of the Azusa Street Revival? It took place in Azusa. you know, And uh, it was a big thing in the 20s big Pentecostal movement kind of took over in America and in the 20s they had this huge Azusa Street revival and they were just all amazed because they were sitting there preaching and suddenly everyone in the room started speaking Mandarin Chinese. It's phenomenal. Now incidentally it's worth noting there was nobody there who actually knew Mandarin Chinese so they were all saying that's what it was but no one was really sure because none of them spoke Chinese. So that must be what it is, right? Good good word. Uh, But the idea here simply is Look, you get overrun and suddenly you start speaking a strange language. It doesn't doesn't mean much. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, Janice and I, att- I don't know how many people have attended that service. Pentecostal service? Anyone? Which service? A Pentecostal oh, service. Oh, no, I never had. Um, you're, you're not speaking in tongues mm-hmm. or, or interpreting tongues. Mm-hmm. You're very, very much an outsider. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, you're, you're sitting there saying to yourself, well, why am I here? Mm-hmm. I mean, I have no idea what's going on. Yeah, uh, they think they're praising God, but I can't praise God with them in any way, shape, or form. Right. In that in that context. Do they do it in every service? Yeah. Depending, it's a, it's a, it depends on the Pentecostal church. But it, the the true died in the wool Pentecostal folks say, if you're not speaking in tongues, you've not received the gift of the Spirit. Yeah. You need to let, have laying out hands to mm-hmm. receive that that gift. I, we all I only went to one service. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It was enough. The one you were at was that. I went to one once. I may have not not gone to a party the night before, but anyways, I went to a, a Pentecostal <laughs> service the next day, and I was supposed. This is I was about eighteen, nineteen years old, and I worked with a guy who was part of a church called Grace Church. Now in, in Colorado, if you're on I twenty five going south towards. Colorado Springs out of Denver, you'll drive by two churches on the east side. Now, it's just worth noting that in Colorado, it's easy to figure out directions because mountains are always west. In California, I'm hopeless. I can't do it. I have no idea where I am. But so I'm driving down there, and there's two churches. There's two Grace churches. And uh, this buddy, this guy I worked with, he was a hardcore Calvinist, like loved reading Calvin. If you ever meet a 19-year-old who likes to read Calvin, Ignore him for three years until he's a nice guy. <laughs> you start reading Calvin, you just become angry for some reason. And Calvinists have said that to me, so I'm not disparaging anyone. So anyhow, I'm like, I'll go to his church. I want to learn more about Calvinism. I want to learn more about this stuff, so I'll go visit him. So I, so I go to the Grace Church I think he belongs to, Pentecostal Church. And they just start, they sing shout to the Lord 25 times until people are worked up and people are coming forward and falling down. And I thought... Yeah, this is not the right church. <laughs> and the pastor got up and said, I'm going to a big meeting in Florida and we're going to have to pray like crazy because can you imagine that only uh, not not even 50% of Pentecostal preachers speak in tongues anymore? It's like the spirit is leaving. And I thought, yeah, he may have and I'd probably better too. So <laughs> I left because this was way out of my element. Um, and I was just very, I, I was very uncomfortable. I, I didn't, I'm already uncomfortable in those the contemporary service where my hands can be anywhere beside my pocket or holding a book with music in it. I'm already uncomfortable there, but there people are, you know, Weird. like at the fish concert I went to two weeks ago, <laughs> flying or swaying around and all this kind of stuff. And I, I say that tongue in cheek, but it's, I'm actually not joking. No, it is. There's there's a very similar thing that takes place in both scenarios, which makes you ask the question: How do I know one's with the Holy Spirit and one's not with Trey Anastasio up on stage, right? I mean, what do I know here? The proof of the Spirit is what? It's Christ preached. If Christ is preached, the Spirit is there. If Christ is not preached and tongues are preached, hmm, 
or good works are preached apart from Christ or anything Self, yeah uh, glorification or what was what's Lewis's line in the screw tape letters uh, Jesus and yeah. right Jesus and so here's Jesus but now let's get down to the real business of our role in politics or let's get down to the real business of our position on this or that and it's not Christ crucified for sinners it's it's not the Holy Spirit see so you want to know if you're in a church that has the Holy Spirit don't look for uh, great numbers or excitement or joy look at depressed Germanic looking people hearing about Christ and then you know you're in the right church no look for the preaching of Christ it used to be you could look at a church sign and say that denomination will preach Christ. It's not that way anymore. You've got to listen to the preacher. You've got to listen to what he's saying from the pulpit. And if it's not Christ, even if it's a... And I say that, again, I say that tongue-in-cheek, but if it's a dry, boring service, but Christ crucified is proclaimed, the Holy Spirit is at work more there than the exciting service down the street with a light show and a really inspiring message. Does you see that? Do you see the point there? Unless Christ is in that, and then you know, great, good on them. But the point is, it's it's Christ. It's the Spirit brings Christ. He will convict the world of of, of sin and righteousness, and something else. And John, something. Go ahead. What, isn't the Pentecostals, or wasn't it the Pentecostals that also handled serpents, snakes? Some of them. The extreme, extreme. Pentecostals are the ones that are the West Virginia folks who drink poison and get, get bit by snakes. Yeah. There was some dude who recorded himself doing that and then died on the video. <laughs> oh, yeah. He, like, it just was a recording of him swelling up because of the snake poison and dying. Because he was going to prove to the world that, you know, we have Christ. And he, and he killed himself. Sort of testing the Holy Spirit. Now, now where do they get this from? Mark 16, uh, Jesus says... Uh, you will go into the world and drink poison and be bit by serpents and they will not harm you. There's all kinds of issues with Mark 16. That is arguably the strangest verse in the New Testament. Some scholars go so far as to argue it shouldn't be in the New Testament. I, I tend to be on their side with that one. Uh, but the point there, I mean, even if not, in the book of Acts, Paul is, they're, they're stranded on an island and they're on this island and a snake comes and bites Paul. And all the people say, he's cursed. The gods are against him. He's guilty of something. And, the, and it doesn't kill him. And they go, whoa, the gods are on his side. <laughs> you see, and so suddenly he has a platform to preach. And it's just great because, I mean, I mean, you sort of start to think about how the serpent can't accuse Paul anymore. The people are accusing him of being guilty of something. Anyways, there's a great gospel angle there. But the point is, Jesus does not say, go drink poison and have snakes bite you to prove that I'm on your team. He's saying, I'm, I'm going to protect you. I'm for you. Nothing's going to stop the preaching of the gospel for the sake of the church. That's the idea there. But they take it to a strange extreme in description. It's very important to have this, this distinction in your mind when you read the Bible, especially Acts. Description versus prescription. Is this describing something to me of what went on, or is it telling me what to do? So, for example, in the book of Acts, you see a description of Paul getting bit by a snake, but no command, go and do likewise. See? Um, so, so there you go. I mean, that's just very important distinction when you read through that stuff. Okay. So if you know enough of the Holy Spirit somewhere, is Christ being proclaimed? Is Christ crucified for sinners? the message. We would, we would say the word and the sacraments. Because even, I mean, the sacraments are key here because even if the pastor, I know you can never imagine it happening, but the pastor botches it up and doesn't give you Christ, at least you get the sacrament that week. And that means the Holy Spirit's still at work for you. He's still giving you Christ despite the pastor. There's an interesting conversation then comes up. <laughs> this is going to take us off. Uh, but with, with liturgy, What's the value of liturgy? Is it just an old way of doing things because, you know, that's what we've always done? Or, or is it sort of there to make sure we get Christ no matter what? I, I told you the story about me going to that Episcopalian 
ordination in that Los Angeles. That sermon was abysmal, but the people left getting Christ. Corrupted the liturgy. Well, no. And I might say the liturgy saved the service because God's word was there. Luther says this about Rome. They're saying, Luther, you, you're starting a new church. You're saying that we've been wrong for 1,500 years and that no one's been saved. Luther says, no, you've had the word of God. And in spite of you, people are still believing it, you know. Uh, we're just trying to get back to that. So it's, it's the same idea. It, the Spirit's at work, and the gates of hell will not conquer the church, even when the church is trying to let hell in the door. See? So, stuff worth, worth thinking about. And it seems to me that what little exposure I've had to other churches, but like we all have occasionally been, that, that the Lutheran liturgy is very... Uh, it, it, tracks the Bible very closely. Yeah, the, the, the beauty of the liturgy is it's just Bible verses. You're just singing Bible verses. We don't do the Nunc Dimittis because it's really difficult to sing, but the Nunc Dimittis is fantastic where it's just the song that Simeon sings after he sees Jesus. And think about when we do that in the service, right? We'll do it during Advent when we do that special service, that third setting or whatever. But after Nicodemus sees Jesus... Lord, now let your servant depart in peace from my, for thy, uh, my eyes have thank you, yeah. I was going to say my eyes have been fulfilled, which is, I think, right, but not what it says. Um, yeah, that's it, that's it. When do we say that in the service? Right after communion, when the same Jesus who Nicodemus held in his hands has come to us in bread and wine. I mean, think about that. And so we're saying, look, we're kind of with Nicodemus on this thing. Or when we do the benediction. Those are words God gave to Moses for the Aaronic priests, Aaron's priests, to to proclaim over Israel at the end of their gatherings. And we are saying there, we are the continuation of the people of God going all the way back to that. And that same good word, benediction, good word, is spoken to us as was spoken to those people. There's a richness and a depth to this that it can become uh, rote, but that's the pastor's fault because he's not teaching it. He's not telling you what it is, you know. Um, and, and when you have that, you can start to say, okay, now what, what can we do with this? What, what can we build here to help sort of enhance our understanding in that? But when you just say, look, the spirit can't be there because, you know, there's a script in the book. Well, hold on. That's how the entire Old Testament operates. That's what the Psalms are. Is worship. They're hymnals, you know. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah. I just I just wanted to say I didn't think that much not the minutes is hard to sing. Uh the one well. <laughs> the one we had so when I got here we never sung it and we did it one Sunday and people were like, Yeah. I, I it's actually, tough. I actually sing that song in my head a lot. Which what 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 can you do you Lord mind? Knows. Lord, let thy servant yeah. depart in peace. Lord, let thy servant depart in peace, according, according to, to thy will. Yeah, the one we sing is. No, there's, there's a couple. There's th- well, there's three settings, four settings, five, whatever it is. Now let thy servant depart, depart in peace. Yeah, that one's not bad. Yeah. It's 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 not. Oh, this is a personal thing of mine. But, yeah. Um, I, I don't know how the guys. Apparently, people had a lot higher range, voice range. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because us, us baritones. Yeah. We can't hack a lot. Of, no, I, a, lot of, a lot of the songs. In, in the there's a lot. There's a few things I remember from growing up, uh, going to worship services. But one of them is is my dad coming home and my mom saying that one was too high this week. <laughs> like he was singing these hymns yeah, that I nobody can sing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Elvis yeah. yeah. Presley could sing it. Well, <laughs> if if only he were here. Uh, <laughs> We, were, we talked about him this morning, too. That's funny. Yeah. Uh, a quick one. If yep. you really look at the hymnal, as I recall, every time there's a uh, passage from Scripture, you'll see some very fine print off on the side with where it came from. Yeah, that's right. It, yeah. it identifies the verses. And in fact, what we'll see as we go through the book of Revelation is some of this will be so familiar to us, and you'll say, hot dog, wait, I that. sing that on Sunday. <laughs> How about that? Um, the... the um, uh, uh, this is the feast, right? It's straight out of Revelation. So it's all there. very interesting stuff. Yeah. So and, I mean, this is great because pa- 
Pastor Koch says, when people are like, maybe we should do something different. He goes, yeah, but we're doing this for the kids. And I mean, there's something to that because you know how your kids are going to learn the Bible? From the liturgy, you know. I mean, that's a, be- that's a beautiful thing, actually. And so this, this sort of, it kind of becomes rote. Well, it can but there's actually a to, virtue in that. We are uh, during Advent. We'll do setting um, th- three or four. I, I, maybe it's five. We use setting three. I can't remember which one it is. Setting two is what we used when I got here, and I'd never done that one before. Now I've got it uh, after eight years. Uh, setting one is the one I grew up with, and I. I just never get tired of it. Whenever we sing, this is the feast, I'm, I, I get excited. Like, I'm actually happy. Yeah, like you know? so, yeah. All right, well. In Bible I'm, studies, we, go, we have a four or five year cycle in a sense where we cover all the, I mean, ideally, we cover everything. In the Bible? The Bible, of course, but the liturgy and everything that's tied into the Bible. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what there is. Doing. There is something that. Yeah, oh, the three year lectionary, yeah. No, the lectionary is something else. Those are. There's a group of um, folks, I don't know who they are, who get together and say these would be the best verses for the churches to hear throughout the year. And there's now we're using a newer sort of revised lectionary, I guess it's called, which is fine. But, you know, what's interesting about those is they're very um, safe. You just don't have the imprecatory psalms, the really harsh psalms during the lectionary readings. And you'll notice sometimes we'll just skip stuff in the readings, which drives the readers nuts because they've got one chapter with six sections, you know. Yeah, especially when they're on three separate pages. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and out of order. Oh, it's, it's maddening. It's all in there, yeah. There's the one year and the three year. Well, and there's also Thank one for you. Christmas Eve, Christmas Midnight, Christmas Dawn, and Christmas... Yeah, if you're going to follow, if you're going to be... Um, <laughs> You're going to do all of those. You need at least an assistant pastor for that sort of thing. So, or a vicar. Which is what I really want to get. Boy, do I want a vicar because my car does not get washed like it should. What's that? What, what were you going to say, Tom? I just, I just remember my vicarage, you know. and I'm just thinking about my vicarage. Yeah, yeah thank you. No, I just wanted to say... It's a little aside, but um, you, you like this is the feast. Um, Janice and I happened to be at Estes Park uh-huh. at a pastor teacher conference when um, this is the feast where that, that hymnal came out. Oh, okay. And we got to hear teachers and pastors four part. That's oh, jeez, that's it great. Made me cry. Oh, I imagine it did. I'd oh, never heard boy, I never heard it before. That yeah. made me cry. That's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And at the when you go to pastors' conventions. <laughs> Have I talked to you about the last pastors' convention I went to? No. I can't do it without breaking the eighth commandment. Let's just say this: it, wasn't. it would be okay for folks who planned pastors' conferences to just say we're going to use the hymnal, because very lounge very acts aren't great. But here's the thing: when you have a bunch of pastors just get together and you hear all in a Missouri Senate pastors conference all these men sing a mighty fortress that is actually something pretty powerful about that my dad talked about when he went to um, Promise Keepers in Georgia and it's all these guys singing you know the church is one foundation it's a, it's a pretty powerful thing um, it doesn't have to be a great fancy production you know um, although there's, a, there's value in that, too. And you can have a beautiful piece put together in all of this um, by all means. But these these songs really are quite good in and of themselves. And so there's something to be said for that. Okay. They're dynamic. Yeah, they really are. There's a great article I just read. And it's interesting. It's challenging me. Because I'm not actually opposed to most contemporary worship. I think some of it's good. Some of it's not. But there was a guy who was saying it's, it's kind of going away. And part of the reason is it just doesn't have the staying power of the, what you have in your hymnals. It just doesn't. So, And he said, don't think this is like a cheap shot or something like this. If you look at the great hymn, hymnal hymn guys, Isaac Watts, Johann Gerhard, um, uh, 
Uh, uh, these guys. Well, Luther himself. Sure. Oh. Wesley. Ch- Wesley. Charles Wesley. Okay. Yes. We have in our hymnal probably, I would guess, just off the top of my head, six Wesley hymns. Wesley probably penned 500 hymns, right? And they don't have that kind of staying power. And we think we're going to put together these sort of quick things and and expect them to have that kind of meat. And the guy said the the big problem is in contemporary worship, you only have four or five that are actually able to stand the test of time, but they won't because they're sung every three weeks in a church. Mm -hmm. It's something we're thinking about. The second verse, Sam is the first. Yeah, second. That's right. That's That's right. Jimmy's got seven. Yeah, that's seven right. Songs, seven over well, we've had times. a couple of different uh, hymnal series <laughs> over the last. I'm Henry VIII. Thing there it is. What's that? We, we used to have the blue hymnal and then the red. Hymnal. Here was uh, in, in the Missouri Synod, you had the red hymnal. At which point they decided we needed to make this more contemporary, so they had to add the blue hymnal and a mutiny on their hands. And then uh, when I, after I got here, right around the time I got here, so eight to nine years ago. The new hymnal, this burgundy one came out, which is supposed to be sort of the best of all worlds, and there hasn't been quite the uprising about it, but it's been received quite well, because it's great. I mean, it's really a good hymnal. It's accessible. It's it's just, it's really a wonderful thing. I, I encourage you guys to borrow one, as Art and I have discovered. People do more than borrow them. They don't walk out of here by themselves, which is fine. If you're going to steal anything, steal a hymnal, great. Um, or a Bible, yeah. But, but I mean, there's some, there's some value in having this thing that really does help teach the faith and make it consistent and all that kind of thing. So, all right. So, that's not to say that, you know, you have a hymnal, you have the Holy Spirit, but it is to say that what we find in the hymnal delivers Christ better than can be done otherwise. And it's not just a matter of having this stodgy old archaic book. There's actually a great, uh, it's a very, you said a dynamic thing, you know. Um, what would you find? Oh, I always remember this from the kid after the sermon, Create Me a Clean Heart. Yeah, good, yeah. I also like the one... Um, Starts. You have the words of eternal. Yeah. Uh, um, Shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, before, before the gospel before reading. The gospel. Yeah. Which we don't do. Um, yeah. But that, I, don't, I don't see it in here. In the. Uh, in the other settings. Well, I've been looking at all the settings. Yeah. I don't know. Between the lessons. You may want to look at the um, service of of uh, prayer and preaching or. Service of the Word, or Compline, or one of those. It may be in the Matins one. Anyhow, that's where I really learned this stuff was Matins. When I went to college, my church had become a very contemporary worship church, which is fine. It's fine. But when I got to college, they had a Matin service, and I would go and I would mock it. I would, I would go because I thought it was funny, almost as a joke. And by the end, it was the only one I wanted to go to. It really was. Because I started reading what you're seeing there in the Matin service, and it's this, it's just telling the story of God as your creator and who you are and you're singing with all the angels and all this stuff. I mean, it's, it's remarkable. And then you start to listen, and we'll talk about this more when we get into the book, when you listen to like the, the communion liturgy we have um, and we say with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify. I mean, just think for a moment what we're, we have the audacity to say that we are in the presence of the saints and the angels singing praises to Christ, the Lamb on the throne, who's giving us himself and this bread and wine. And you're sitting there going, yeah, our church kind of looks like a double wide and our piano's a little bit out of tune. And you have the audacity to say this? And we're like, yeah. Because hidden in all of this is Christ, you know. I mean, it's just beautiful. It's beautiful stuff that we, we have truly... Um, unfortunately undermined due to lack of teaching. And, and I mean, I'm partially responsible for this, but it's stuff to think about, just stuff to chew on and work over in your head. Okay, I want to move past that because I could keep bringing up different parts and we could go on for hours. All right, we haven't even gotten halfway through the first verse. Seven stars, and I, this is where I wanted to spend my time. What do the seven stars represent? This came up in chapter one. No, close. This is Revelation chapter 1, verse 20. 
Seven stars are the seven angels. Seven angels. And now, there has been a tremendous amount of confusion over this discussion that we had um, about what are the angels. Um, and I, I want to make sure we're, we're all clear. Uh, it could be either literal angels or pastors or the spirit of the church. Uh, I, I want to make sure I was clear in the way I, I said this because it, it set some people off the wrong way. Because uh, I believe I said um, the angels, my interpretation is pastors and look at me, I'm the angel of the church. You know, <laughs> I did not mean to imply anything proud or self-glorifying in that statement. It was a, it was being kind of tongue-in-cheek. By angels, what we would understand is simply the one bringing the word of God, the messenger delivering the word, so that good old Pastor Bob isn't anything. He's got a message to deliver. Um, and that's what the word angel is Greek for messenger, right? And so the idea here would simply be Here's one who's bringing a message. Um, I did not intend to imply anything particularly spiritual about myself. Um, so forgive me if that was what was uh, understood. Um, and go ahead. Uh, not even the word messenger, really, but communicator. Well, no, but the Greek, the Greek. angelos means message. That's the translation. So it, it, the translation referred to someone who's delivering a message from one city to another, which show up as an angel with a delivery mailman <laughs> kind of idea, right? Uh, that, that's sort of the thing. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah. Well, the pastor and I had a disagreement at, at that same thing, what it meant. And you have to understand that regardless of what that disagreement was, it had absolutely nothing to do with doctrine. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an important thing. We were just simply disagreeing over what that particular word meant. Either one works, and right. it works in the context of salvation. Both, both Dave and I are in the realm of orthodoxy yeah. with our uh, with our understanding we're on the right teams there's just a different understanding of the word you know, if there's a disagreement over doctrine that's one thing but this isn't yeah yeah we we just want to make sure we're clear on that yeah. um, so that Dave just wants to say look I know pastor's right but I'm not quite ready to admit it <laughs> <laughs> so who was it that said that <laughs> was that who was it that said or where did we hear that when you're in heaven I'm not sure you see the angels. They don't go to heaven, but they, oh. uh, they, they're there. They, they're everywhere. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, angels don't have bodies. They they show up sometimes with them, you know, but... Uh. I don't know that they don't, they don't have souls. No, they're spirits. They're spirits, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, but I mean, yeah, just so we're clear yeah. um, on that. Thank you, Dave. Um, okay, yeah. I thought someone else was. I thought I heard a. Well, I'm singing. I'm singing. I almost did, but we're going to move on. Okay. All right. Don't feel bad slowing us down because I've done plenty of that tonight, okay? <sighs> All right. It's 8 o'clock. Jeez. I did the same exact thing this morning. We made it through. So here we go. Um, seven churches, seven stars. The idea here is that the Spirit is at work in the church. The Spirit is fully present with the church, the whole, pres the whole Spirit with the whole church here. Uh, that's the idea of what's going on here, all right? Uh, and where the Spirit is, there is Christ with him. Now, what's wrong? What, is, what does Jesus say that has sort of upset him Well, they look good on the outside. Yeah. But they're not on the inside. Right. You know, so They give all appearances of being alive, but yet must be zombies or they're walking zombies. dead. Really. They're, they're just Dave, don't bring up that mo that oh, show. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that is my current addiction. Oh. It is... I watched five episodes Monday night. Oh, jeez. I, I am in trouble um, with that one. The Walking Dead. Goodness gracious. Okay. It's it's a cute show. All right. It's fine. Um, it's not cute? No. I don't think that's cute at all. Oh. I turned it off immediately. Yeah, well, it's 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 because it's gross. Yeah, it's very gross. Yeah. Okay. He says... Yeah, it's not a... The kids don't watch it with me anyway. <laughs> Nor does the wife or the dog. I know your works. 
that's a strange, that's a scary thing for Jesus to say uh, if your works aren't good ones, right? I know your works. Now, he's seen the works of others and he's been happy with them. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. But right now, the works he's seeing, he's not pleased with. This is not gentle Jesus right now. You have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. You're a walking dead, as Dave said. <laughs> Wake up. Think about this for a second. This is, this is terrific. I mean, this is, a, this is a contextualized sermon right here. This would be like someone who knows the history of Moore Park, you know, and Jesus coming and saying, you've got egg all over your face because it used to be egg farms, you know, for miles here, you know, something like this. Uh, this is the idea. You guys, you have a reputation and you're really proud of your reputation, but you are dead. You are a shell of what you used to be. It's not anything like you think. Wake up and strengthen what remains is about to die. Now, this is a curious thing. What does it mean to look alive but be dead? What, I mean, how would you read that? What do you think Jesus is witnessing here? Hypocrite, what do you mean? Flesh that up. Like on the outside, you look like one thing, but on the inside, you don't, you don't, yeah, yeah, yeah. Believe, you don't believe what you portray. Okay, good. Thank you going through the motions. Yeah, going yeah. through the motions. Yeah, I, I think this is part of it. So you show up, you do all the right stuff, but there's no faith. Yeah. That was like, um, who was that pastor? Johnson he said his dad, until what? He was 55 years old or so. He said, I went to church because my mother said you had to go to church. Huh. He served offices in the church, but he never really truly believed until he was like, 55 years ago. Yeah, yeah. He said, I brought home a bunch of books from the seminary. And he said, I didn't read them during the summer, but he did. But his dad did. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So yeah. that would have been somebody was going through the motion. Just sort of doing it because it's the right, right thing to do. Mom made me go to church. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. So that that's part of it, right? What else might it be? False teaching. Yeah, it's going to be false teaching. I think you're right. Now, but the false teaching is not to the degree of what we see perhaps in the last letter where Jesus is naming people Jezebel for introducing false worship into the church because their reputation is not one of false worship, right? I don't mean to shake my finger. That's not <laughs> supposed sure. to be. Sure. Anyway. Well, I mean, reputation seems like uh, when you talked about the Pharisees or something doing stuff for show. Yeah. Not just so they look good, but not really yeah. doing it for their own or their own belief. Jesus' nickname for the Pharisees, I think that's I think that nails it, Jeff. I Jesus' uh, uh, nickname for the Pharisees at one time is you whitewashed tombs. How about that? You're really pretty graves. <laughs> like on the outside, you got a really nice picture of yourselves, but inside there's a lot of death. And maybe that's what we're seeing in Sardis is uh, a sort of ritualistic legalism where we're running through the motions. We do great works. We look good. We're socially active. We're doing all the right things. Just Christ isn't a part of it at all. You know what this letter, the more we talked about it this morning, you know what it starts to remind me of? It's Galatians. It starts to sound like Galatians. Because Jesus is going to say, repent, return to where you were at first. Remember Paul's exhortation to the Galatians? If somebody comes along with a new teaching, something different from what I've brought to you, let them be anathema. I don't care if an angel from heaven comes down with a different message. Don't listen to the angel. I don't care if I show up and I've got a different message. If I do, cut me off. I'm no good to you. And what is he fighting against in Galatians? Who remembers? Going back to Judaizers. Judaizers, right? Those coming in saying, in order to be right with God, what do you have to do? Be circumcised. That's right. It's, it's circumcision, and once you're circumcised, it's going to be obedience to the law. And so what's going on in Galatians is legalism is seeping into the church so that righteousness is found in my performance, my obedience, what I do. And these, these Judaizers come in, and man, they look good. They look really good. Why? Because they know the Old Testament, and they preach the Old Testament, and they tie Jesus right into it. To go back to our Screw tape letter C.S. Lewis quote. It's Jesus and the law. Right there. You want to be a good Christian? Here's what you do. 
Gary Anderson says this morning, you just mark, you just check your works off the list and you're pulling it off. Always remember, legalism is checklist religion. Am I doing these things? Then I'm a good Christian. I've told you, one, one of my favorite books that I read, uh, Jesus Plus Nothing Equals Everything, uh, Totally Inch Vision, phenomenal book. But the worst part in that book is he has a checklist of how to tell if you're a legalist. <laughs> and, I, and I read that and I'm like, is there, is there a more legalistic way? Because like, what happens? You get to the end of that and you're like, ah, yeah, see, I'm not legalist like those guys. Oh, you just want to, really, did you just do that? So, yeah, so, it's, I hope it's not, no, I've read it, because I read it once, and then I thought, that's funny, and then I went back, and he goes, my friends at such and such a church have put this list together, I think it's helpful. He's not being sarcastic. You're like, oh. you, should, you should send him a letter, thank you, I, you know, I read your on this. I'm curious what you, uh, maybe I will, I'll tweet yeah, at him. Know, I, yeah. Everyone except number five, I wasn't able to check. Yeah, that's right, so what, am I in? Am I a legalist? Yeah. yeah. It's shoving the gospel right under the law there. I think that's what we see happening in Sardis. Remember how furious Paul is in Galatians because of legalism. Every other letter has a greeting. Hey, guys, we miss you. Yeah, before we get into all that business about you sleeping with your mothers, we just want to say we pray for you and we love you. That's Corinthians, right? Galatians, they're starting to preach legalism. and he's, The first line is, you foolish Galatians, who's bewitched you? What is your issue? You're abandoning Christ in for self-righteousness. Think of Jesus. Does Jesus approve of the practices of the tax collectors? No, but he dines with them. What about the Pharisees? Yeah, he's furious. And given that sort of Jesus' Fahrenheit has raised here a little bit, I might think that we're dealing with a Pharisaical situation in Sardis. This seems to make sense to me. Uh, remember what you received and heard. This is verse 3. In other words, the gospel, what came first? Keep it and repent. Go back to where you were at first. All these works, they look great, but they mean nothing without faith. So we all love James. Faith without works is dead. Hot dog, we agree. It's in the Bible. We're not allowed to disagree. See, yes, faith without works is dead, but works without faith are sins. Because Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. That, is a, that one gets us uncomfortable. But before God, works without faith amount to nothing. Especially because on the day of judgment, they're the things we put before God as our idols. Yeah, but I was a good person. Look, the, the scales balance in my direction here. So you're trusting your works and not Christ. And see, that's the incepin- the, 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 the That's not the word I want. That's the danger Insipid? Yeah, whatever. Uh, uh, Nailed it. That's the insidious thing about works. Yeah. They look great, and all religion is based off of them. And ultimately, they're idols. Because we're trusting them instead of Christ. So, Jesus says, repent of your works. Repent of your good works. The most Lutheran thing I'll say all week. Repent of your good works. Not because the works are good, but because you're trusting them. They're your idols, and your faith is nearly dead because you're so proud of yourselves, you see. Now, John 14, Jesus, John 15. I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Hmm? But in Christ... When you are connected to the branch, I'm sorry, when you're connected to the vine, what happens? You produce good fruit. So see, good works are a part of this, but they're no place to put your faith. They're no place to put your hope because what happens then is you you get one of two things. You get pride, which says, I'm righteous because of what I've done and who I am, and now you're worshiping yourself, essentially. Or you get despair, which says, I'm not good enough to get in. You get what you had in the Pentecostal church, where, "Ah, but I'm not speaking in tongues, so am I a part of this thing? I'm not as righteous as the person next to me. I don't have the many Bible verses memorized. I don't know why the liturgy is in here. (laughs) I can't get to the right page in the hymnal fast enough. These sorts of things. And now we're starting to grade ourselves, and we live in utter fear. 
because our works aren't what they ought to be. So instead, return to Christ, repent of trusting in yourself, and cling to the promises and good works will come. But they're good, as we said on Sunday, they're good because you belong to Jesus, not because they're earning you anything before God or something like this. Does that make sense? Go ahead, Jack. Yeah, it makes sense. And, and, but I've got to say that, again, I, I'm a very process-oriented person. When I yeah. listen to Dave and, and Tom and some of the others in here, and what you said, Jeff, it, it, it's powerful to me because it's bringing up... I, I learn it, I hear it as a process as opposed to doctor, but it is doctrine. It is doctrine. Yeah, okay. And so I get to the doctrine through that process. The, I'm learning. Which is good. Yeah. Which is good. And again, which is why we want to say um, faith is a receiving of Christ, not a fully understanding of everything that's going on, right? And so if you're one of these people who, like, like you're saying, where you're just learning and sort of grasping these things, that doesn't somehow make you less than anybody here. It's because you're in Christ. And we're all in Christ that we're on the same page, or on the same, in a sense, level, and no one is holier than anyone else for any reason. It's all one in Christ Jesus, the baptismal language of Galatians. You are, there's no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, Bible expert or, uh, or newcomer to Bible study, someone who's read Revelation, someone who's never... No, you're all one in Christ Jesus. It's Christ, see. Um, and what happens then in the churches that where your reputation matters more than Jesus is the works become the main thing and people who aren't living up to a certain standard are seen as inferior. Oh, they can still come. Yeah, they can still be here. They're just not going to get to be teaching Sunday school. They're just not going to be getting to be involved with these things because they're not yet as mature as we are, something like this. Maturity language is, is there and it's got its place, but you've got to be careful with it because it becomes judgment. See? Yeah, go ahead, Tom. Um, the LDS Church has carried that to the nth degree. Hmm. It, it, it is exactly sure. their operating model. Yeah, yeah. Um, everything is graded, and, um, and based upon what you're doing, um, that's where you stand in that church. See, yeah. And, and the way they get away with it is because the rest of the world works that way. Yep. And it makes sense. I mean, the, the religion of works is phenomenal because sometimes you pull it off. I mean, that's the worst part is when you come to church and someone says to you, ha ha, you get a better grade, right? I mean, we love this. I got a B instead of C. It's a good thing. In Mormonism, I got an A instead of an A minus because Bs, they're not going to cut it around here. I mean, but you see this. I mean, this is, it's, it's, and then Jesus comes along and says, man, you guys are lame. <laughs> I want to go, I want to go eat with the tax collectors and sinners. They're more fun. They're at least serving drinks, you know. I mean, this is... They got better stories. And they love forgiveness. Oh, they starve for it. You guys, you don't even think about it. They just... They have someone tell them they love them and then mean it, and they've never even heard of that before. You think you deserve it. Stop. Repent. See, I think that's, that's the dynamic you get in Galatians, in Sardis, and in Jesus' relations with the Pharisees. Um, you're forgetting your need of grace. And is it Amzelm, one of the great church thinkers, says, we, you have not yet considered the depth of your sin. And, and the works righteousness takes away that full understanding. Um, okay, good, good. Uh, Jesus said he's going to come as a thief. Yeah, so let's get to that. So Jesus even makes himself to be a sinner. So, I mean, this is an intro. <laughs> I don't know when I'm coming. There's a good gospel angle right there. Here's Jesus making himself to be a sinner and then putting himself on a cross. No, that's not what he means here, though. Uh, he comes as a thief. What does this mean? I think that's a kind of a loose reference to how they were destroyed before by they were asleep at the switch. Yep, yep. And the invaders came in. They could simply walk into the city. And he's yep. suggesting that's going to happen again. Yep. But it's going to be me this time. Yeah, that's right. I'm, and you're not even ready. This, this thief language is language Jesus himself uses. Yeah. Um, I, I th it says here uh, it refers to a day of judgment that will involve Sardis. Yeah. yeah. 
his coming depends on the church's refusal to repent. Now, this is an interesting conversation we had this morning. I, I read that and initially thought he's talking about the second coming, <clears throat> big end times coming. And someone's notes this morning said, no, it's talking about something before that. And I think that's what you're sounding like, yeah, too. probably the same one. It says not a reference to the second Oh, so there you go. I, and in a sense, what he's saying is you guys are running the risk of being cut off as a church, which is a scary thing. Your church is, I mean, this sounds incredibly harsh. And in a sense, it is. But you also, just think about this. If you have a church that isn't preaching Jesus, it's not functioning as a church anymore. It might be a useful thing for the community, but it's not a church. Because the point of church is not community involvement. The point of church is not gathering for rituals. The point of church is getting Jesus, hearing, receiving your forgiveness, you know. Um, and so this idea, you know, Jesus would cut them off. Well, he, they haven't had anything to do with him for a while now. The kids who are growing up in that church aren't being catechized into Christ, you might say. So they're growing up believing something totally different. So when Jesus says, I'm going to cut you off, yeah, because... What difference does it make? Yeah, that's that right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We'll see this in Laodicea, where Jesus is knocking at the door. And the picture there is always, we always say, oh, Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart. Are you going to let him in? No. And the, there, he's standing outside the church and no one's letting him inside. <laughs> it's like, hey, hey, guys. I'm out here, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, that's the idea here. Uh, you're almost to that point. So wake up. I could come at any moment and cut you off. So, so that's the idea. Yeah, that's the thief in the... What is the thief in the night? Where is that verse? I think it's in Matthew. Is it Matthew? Matthew? I can't recall. Matthew, here it says Matthew 24, 42 to 44. All right. Or First Thessalonians? Or yeah, First Thessalonians. Peter, or Second Peter. Maybe, maybe I should look in the text we're preaching here this Sunday. Um, or next week. Yeah, yeah, First Thessalonians 5.2. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Now there, it is referring to the second coming yeah. in First Thessalonians. Oh, yeah. but, that, but that thief in the night stuff is just Jesus' favorite analogy for his unexpectedness. Your, your guard is down. And I think, Dave, you get it nail on the head right there. Um, good. Okay. Let's keep trucking here. Um, yet, what's the good news? There are a few good ones left. Yeah. There's still a few good men there. Yeah. And notice this. This, this issue of names... This is something I've never noticed before, but it's almost every time Jesus is pleased or something, names comes up. Names is a, is a gospel word here. There's, a, there's the names of a few that I remember. Antipas, he names him. Now Jezebel, Bar uh, <laughs> Balaam and Balak, not Barak, Dave. Um, Balaam and Balak. Uh, these guys are named, but no one's named specifically in the churches is referring to something thing else. But the issue of names comes up a good deal. And remember, we made this baptismal connection that when you're baptized, you're baptized into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Um, in Acts, you were baptized into the name of Jesus. His name is being put on you. Jesus is saying there are still some there who have not soiled their garments and will walk with me in and talk with me in the white, in, in white, uh, for they are worthy. Um, now, this this garment name stuff is baptismal language in the New Testament. Baptized into the name, and then think of Galatians, where he says those who have been baptized into Christ have been clothed in Christ. Ephesians five in this beautiful passage about marriage where Paul starts talking about how husbands and wives should relate to one another and then uh, slips into talking about the gospel instead. And he says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and has uh, adorned her in white, washing her uh, so that she is, so she's prepared beautifully for his father or something like this. And the idea there is, I mean, it's very baptismal language, right? Washed in water. I think it's, I should look at it to make sure I say it properly and don't put words in Paul's mouth. Um... 
five. Five. Yeah. <clears throat> Are you there, Dave? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, let's go. I'll just go real quick here. Um, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. And and notice here, the way uh, Paul is talking about Jesus' relationships with the church uh, is, is, is baptismal, washed with water and took all the spots and wrinkles and cleansed her. And you have the picture of the, the bride and the white and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but the church is depicted in white robes. That's baptismal stuff. Okay? Um, and so the name, baptism, there are those there who have not decided to abandon what they were given in baptism, uh, who have not soiled their robes but still hold to it. Them, they're worthy. Because of because they're just so good at keeping their clothes clean? No. Because they're clinging to Christ and they're trusting the promises. His righteousness, you know. Um, and this continues on then. Um, the one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I mean, now, now these are just great gospel promises. One, uh, to those who conquer, they'll be clothed in white garments. Again, now this, go ahead, Tom. Uh, well, in verse 5, yep. he who overcomes will like them be dressed in white. Yep. It seems to be referring to a different group. Is your says he like them? He who overcomes will like them. Huh. That's curious. So mine says... It, it, it seems to refer to a, a different group, different from the people who, who do not have soiled clothes at this point. Yeah. The ones that, that unsoiled their clothes. I thought he was referring back to the few who were okay. Yeah. You see, mine, the way mine translated is this way. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, which would make it sound like he's referring to the people ahead of in, in the previous verse. Yours makes it, I agree with you, yours makes it sound like it's referring to some other group of people. Now, the commentators do not follow that route. So I've not heard that before, and I wasn't working with that translation. I will make a note to look a little closer and to see what the exact language in the Greek is, if it is a thus or if it is a like them. And, and see if I can't get at that question. Because that's a curious thing. My, my reading of this is, those who are clothed in white, sort of maybe speaking to the group ahead of them, wake up, strengthen what remains because you're about to die, to those ones he's saying, look, if you repent and trust in the gospel, you will be back in that group and like them clothed in white. That would make sense to me if that's where it's going. Yeah, that, that's what it sounds like. From yeah, me. yeah, I, I think that would be a, a a good reading of it. Yeah, yeah. But now, notice this: what happens to those who are clothed in white? Can someone go? We'll do this real quick. Revelation seven thirteen through seventeen, and if somebody can go to Revelation twenty two fourteen, please. Twenty two fourteen. Yeah, please. And who's got the seven? Which one? Uh, seven, thirteen through seventeen. Okay. Yeah, go ahead and do that one first, there, uh, Tom. Then one of the elders asked me, "These in white robes, who are they, and where do they come from?" I answered, "Sir, you know." And he said, "These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood." of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Goodness gracious. So there you have Oh, man, that's great. Uh, 
Yeah, yes, yes. Um, but those clothed in the white robes then are those who attain to the resurrection. These are the people who are in the presence of Christ. So notice he's saying, this is great. Oh, gosh, this is great. Because there in Revelation 7, you have a picture of, of the eternal place, the present heaven, all this kind of stuff, right? Here he's talking to people. He's saying there are those in Sardis who are already in white robes, who are already, in a sense, those people, though they have not yet died, that already and not yet business, see. Um, so you, now who have faith, are counted among the great saints who stand before the throne of heaven. When you come to the sacrament, you're with the saints and the angels. See, this is this thing we're talking about here. Uh, Revelation 22, what was that one? Okay, uh, Revelation 22, verse 14. <clears throat> Blessed are those who wash their robes that they might have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. There you go. So what do they get to do? They're in. They're in. They're, They're in. eating from the tree of life, which is, a, which is a big fancy way of saying not ever dying ever. <clears throat> I think that's how I would have said it if I'd done it. You're not ever dying ever. Uh, and then also you're going into the city. So, so this is what the white robes represent, right? Purity, all this kind of stuff. You're right with God. Uh, so big gospel language here. What else? Your name is where? Book of Life. And, it, and who will blot it out? Jesus won't. It's great. Oh, it's just great. Jesus will not blot it out. We had this discussion this morning. Um, and this is where, you know, it sort of forces us to really ask ourselves, how much gospel can we really believe? Uh, th this kind of reminds us of Romans 8, 28. Nothing in all creation, neither life nor death nor angels, nor nothing in all creation will separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. And someone says, well, yeah, but, you know, you'll notice on that list, like, that my name's not mentioned. So I can do it. I can separate myself from the love of God, right? So that Jesus would blot me out of the book of life. And, and you sit there and you go, doctrinally speaking, yeah, sure. I mean, these warnings, like the beginning here, these aren't fake warnings. Wake up before you lose your faith. I mean, that's a possibility, but if you're reading Romans 8.28 and looking for the loophole for how you still somehow have the ability to manage your salvation because you can't control it's being saved, but at least you can control damning yourself, you know. You're sort of missing the point of the verse. Right? This, is, this, is, this is not what the verse is trying to get you to do. When Jesus says here, I will not blot you out of the book of life, he's not saying, so try me. He's making a promise to you. I wrote your name in there. My hands were bloody when I did it. And I was looking through the hole in my hand to use a crass, grotesque example. Well, I wrote your name there. I'm not taking it out. It cost me a lot to put it there. And I'm not removing it. And we say, but can't I sin my way out? The question there is, we, we try and make this so sort of academic, right? Like, yeah, but I can still lose my salvation. And the question at this point ceases to be an academic one and it becomes a pastoral one. Well, why in the world would you want to do that? Why would you want to deny Christ? Why would you want to try and get your name erased from the book of life? Well, I don't. Well, then why bring it up? Because you might be worried about doing it inadvertently. Yeah, I think that's the issue. I think it is. But it, so, the, so then the answer is, but look what he just said. I will not. I will not blot your name out. But what if I... No, no, no. He just said he's not doing it. I, I think that's exactly right, Keith. I think people are worried that what if somehow I slip up and I... I but nothing is going to be able to separate you. The, those verses that are warning people about falling away are talking to people in crass sin who are seeking ways to do things counter to Christ. It's not about the person living in fear saying... What if, I, what if I slip up? What if I sin again? What if this temptation I continually fight against gets me again this Thursday night? Does that mean I'm out? Jesus is saying, I'm not blotting you out. But to the person who says, well, Christ saved me, so I'm going to go do whatever I want and you know, forget him, whatever. Well, now you're not asking, now you need the law because you're worshiping something different. See? Go ahead, Tom. You're, you're like itching to say no, something. I, 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 
I cannot imagine a scenario in which you accidentally lost your salvation. Yeah, it just doesn't work that way. When you read passages like Romans 8, yeah. you know, how, could you, how could you accidentally you know, fall into something that would, that would cause you to lose your salvation? Yeah. It's, what, it's, if take, take a really what, what if you go to a Pentecostal church or something like that? <laughs> well, this is... <laughs> no, but that's why he hasn't answered that question. Maybe you didn't intend to do something like that. But... <clears throat> Yeah, I, <laughs> I can't. I can't. I cannot envision. It, it, to me, it, it would take a really heroic act. Yeah. To, to, to get to a point where you could say, "Yeah, I, Lord, go away." That and that's away. and that's what it is. That's what does it. It's the Lord go away. It's. I mean, inadvertently, it would be something like this. Arrogance. Yeah, and it's people it, that want to be in charge. Inadvertently, it comes along like this in the church, though, and this is where you want to worry. Is where you say, "Well, look." Do we really have to preach the gospel again this week? Can we do something new and different? I mean, and that's where it becomes, okay, you know, you know, maybe you're right. I mean, we've done this same sermon for eight years now. Maybe we should do a different one. Pastor could use a new illustration, you know, a different theme. Um, and so we try something small and different, and then it builds up to inadvertently become something else. That's where you're getting in trouble. But again, this is where the Sardis texts in Galatians are so helpful is the word of God saying, wake up. No, 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 that's, that's drawing you away. Christ is not abandoning. And notice, he's not abandoned Sardis. That's why he's yelling. And when your kid runs into the street, you're screaming, hey, there's no car coming, but there will be. See, And so at that point, it's an awareness. When we do those excommunication passages from Matthew 18, the person who's being excommunicated, there's an awareness of why it's happening because a ton of work has gone into them. Um, in fact, in the in, in the one of the hymnals, the agenda, the various services that we have, we have a service for excommunication. So the person who's being excommunicated knows why. I'd be curious if one ever actually showed up to that service. <laughs> but, but I mean, I, exactly, you're right. But I do think there's a sort of love there that says, we're giving a service for you because we want you to repent, you know. So... I think you're exactly right, Tom. An inadvertent blasphemy is hardly what the, is to be worried about. This is Jesus saying to those people in Sardis whose every single person around him is going away, and they're probably belittling him and mocking him. Jesus saying, I'm not erasing your name. I, I, I your, was, your pastor's bad sermons aren't getting you rid of me. I was raised with the idea that if, if I strayed away from the Catholic Church, I'd be excommunicated. Sure. Yeah. Which is pretty close to this. The... Uh, the way, the way they want to, they want to say it, and and so I've I've spent a lot of time thinking about what would it take to tell God to just go away, right? You know, get out of my life and go away. I don't want to hear from you anymore. I don't want to have anything to do with you. I just I just don't think it could happen by accident. Yeah. And there's even I mean, even then, there's sort of things where you say. I mean, even there, I kind of want to say, if someone's talking to God like that, their faith's not gone. They're just yeah. angry. Still there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're just angry at something. Because the psalmists almost, they never say go away, but sort of almost more faithless. Where have you been? <laughs> right? uh, uh, you seem to be completely absent. Uh, and so, yeah, it, it's, it's a really, I think it's, Dr. Rosenblatt, if you ever... Look up Dr. Rosenblatt on the internet. It's just fantastic. He's got a great thing you should watch sometime called The Gospel for Those Broken by the Church, which is just something every pastor should watch twice a year or listen to twice a year. And every Christian too, but I mean, it's a warning to pastors as well as an outreach to people who have been burned by their church. But Dr. Rosenblatt used to say, uh, when you have the Calvinist group, it's once saved, always saved, you never lose your salvation. Well, that's, you can't do that with the Bible passages. You just can't. But then you got the extreme other end, which you, we have what we call the Arminians, the extreme evangelicals, who will say, uh, every time you sin, you're out. So you've lost your salvation 16 times before lunch. It's Rosa Blot's line. And he only had 12 lines, so I remember that one. Uh, and, but then he says, so for us Lutherans, we say you can lose your salvation. It's just really, 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 really hard. That heroic act stuff is right. Because our default mode is God and grace. That he's not 
sitting above you with Damocles' sword just waiting to drop it on your head. But he's there as a merciful father towards you. He's not waiting for you to screw up so he can finally cut you off. That's not how God works. He's a father to you who loves you to the point that when you're trusting in things like your own works, he's sending Jesus to your church to say, wake up, come back to the gospel. And so what we have here is, even here we might say, the law is coming under the umbrella of the gospel to draw people back, to get them to repent so they're listening to Christ again and not thinking about just how darn good they are. (laughs) Another line from Rosenblatt, to think about how they stuck in their thumb and pulled out a plum and thought, what a good boy am I, right? Like, that's just not the Christian church. Um, So, that's great. And then the last one, which which is just mind-blowing. Jesus says, and I will confess his name before my father and before the angels. There There is nothing that drives me more than that thought this idea that on the last day, Jesus will say, Bob was one of mine. Father, he's yours. He was purchased with my blood. Think about it. Jesus saying your name, like Antipas. Remember earlier, Antipas is uh, like in the days of my servant Antipas. Jesus says, he who confesses me before man, I will confess before my father and his angels in Luke chapter 12. Chapter 12, yeah. It's phenomenal to think about. Not me confessing Christ, but Christ, in a sense, confessing me to God. Um, Oh, that's good. I mean, just just think about that. Jesus wanting to say your name to the Father, holding open the book of life. You know, there you are. That's you. Purchase Jesus of mine. is going to be busy for a real long time. Yeah, it's nice that he has an eternity, right? <laughs> Good luck, guys. And I think one of the, you know, we don't know what that day will be like, but for the, for the righteous, for the righteous through the blood of Christ, if we had to sit through the reading of every name in the book of life, every name is going to be a party. I mean, you think about this. Here's the person. Here's what they did. Here's what Christ did for them. And we're going to be like, Oh, man, let's get a cake. You know, oh, this is true, because hopefully we can have gluten in heaven. And it, oh, it'll just be wonderful. And then the next person comes along. Who's next? And, you know, millions of people coming through, 144,000 at least, coming through and saying all these amazing things that the Lord has done. And we'll just be celebrating the whole time. And then the book will be done. And like, well, we got an eternity to do something else. Let's read it again. You know, <laughs> It'll be like, oh, it'll be like... Uh, my son, he likes this little book. I want my hat back. You know, it's Mark's birthday. We'll use it for an illustration. Every night, can we read I want my hat back? Yeah, we can read it again. Uh, it's a book of life. Let's read it again. Oh, this is, this is incredible. I can't believe it. You know, so. I think I get, I need to get a nap before this starts. I'll never really get through. <laughs> oh, it's going to be great. The soul ledger is going to be big. That's right. That's right. So this is, this is the promise to start. So I, when you think about his frustration, I want you to think about it in these terms. This is what you're giving up because you're so darn proud of yourselves. This is the book of life party. you know. Me confessing your name before the Father. You don't have to boast about yourself. I'm going to do it for you. Even that, I mean, goodness. You want to give up that for this stuff? you know? That's why Jesus and Paul get so angry at legalism. Because it just ruins the gospel. So, what's interesting though is that there is still a chance. Yeah, yeah. Don't still count. Yeah, you know, he's condemning them and saying, "You guys are just really screwing up." Yeah. But if you repent, turn back, overcome, you'll be in with the party. These aren't Jezebels, right? Who are who are out? Right. There is still the call to repentance here. Again, again, think of all this under the umbrella of the gospel. He's speaking to uh, his children who are leaving. Which goes hand in hand with Tom's comment about how hard it is to really do something. Yeah. To get to the point where you... Yeah, Jesus is, Jesus is so stubborn, you know. <laughs> he just doesn't want to stop. He, 
that 70 sec that verse you know you say forgive seven times I say you not seven times but 77 yeah I think he holds himself to that one too maybe more well. yeah Fortunately yeah. for some of us. Yeah, that's right. See. So, okay, good. That's great. That's a good place to end. Um, okay, let's close with the... Uh, doxology. I was going to say the Tadam because I'm now in liturgical mindset. Yeah, let's close with the doxology. Let's sing. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Awesome stuff. Thanks, you guys. Have a great night. Thanks for listening to this Bible study presentation from Faith Lutheran Church in Moorpark, California. We hope this has helped you grow in your Christian faith and study of the Bible. For more information, visit us on the web at faithmoorpark.com. Music by Kevin McLeod.